Hello, BookTube. Uh, as you will know if you follow my super sexy Instagram account, uh, I went back to the Brattle Bookshop <laughs> this morning, first thing. Very foggy morning, very, very humid and foggy morning, not a hint of sunlight when I was there. Uh, the Brattle Bookshop, for those of you who are new, there are 200 of you here who are new, that is a used bookstore in the heart of downtown Boston. They're fantastic. I have been going there for a long, long time. They're, they've got three floors. First two are just your your ordinary all-purpose uh, jam-packed all different subject headings used bookstore where a lot of the books are double stacked where the, there's nothing chaotic and piles on the floor or anything like that but uh, it's a fantastic used bookstore uh, it, it, it made made all the more so by the fact that the Brattle is out all the time buying they're very actively turning over their stock at all times the third floor is antiques and collectibles I don't know that floor very well I don't I don't I almost never go up there. Uh, but in addition to all that, there's also a sale lot next door, which is the floor space of an entire other building. Uh, it's not a small sale lot, in other words, it's huge. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of sale books out there, $1, $3, and $5. Uh, on any subject under the sun, they're only organized according to price. So you really have to comb through those cards. There's no way to do it quickly. You have to comb through those cards and just build an armload of books. You can't expect that you're going to be able to go right back to where you saw something interesting and grab it. You won't be able to do that. You have to just grab the books, anything that you're potentially interested in. And then you get to the end, you might do that at another used bookstore or at a retail bookstore. You get to the end and you've got an armload of books and then it's time to, to you know step aside and winnow out that pile for what you really want versus what's only a whim. Only when you reach that moment at the Brattle, you don't have to do that because the books are so cheap that you can just buy everything that your first instinct told you about and you'll be fine. <laughs> you won't have spent that much money. Uh, I myself didn't spend any money today. I was using store credit. Uh, so I got a pile of books, <laughs> which doesn't really coincide too accurately with all of my latest palaverings about loving ebooks. Uh, but there is a thrill to the hunt. Right, that came up in uh, Sean Stanfast did a live stream yesterday. Uh, all about buying books online was what's the original, the kickoff organizing uh, sort of topic. Of course, with a live stream, you start off with an organizing topic, but you don't stay on that topic. It just becomes a discussion. In the good ones, in the good, in the good live streams, it becomes just a discussion. Uh, the, the the yardstick, the, the way you'll be able to tell a good live stream from a bad live stream is that the good live streams can become a conversation because the live streamer knows what the F they're talking about. If a live stream doesn't become a conversation, it's because the live streamer doesn't have any idea what the F they're talking about. In other words, it's a pure matter of confidence. That's all. Uh, Fortunately, Sean knows what the F he's talking about. So that came up uh, in the course of the discussion that ensued. It came up that the thrill of the hunt, the thrill of serendipity, of encountering something you weren't looking for, is an element of, of in-person book hunting that cannot be duplicated online. Much as I love ebook reading and much as I love the incredible convenience of online book shopping, that is absolutely true. Uh, and that's a big part of why you would continue to go back to a place like the Brattle. Of course, for me, is another element that came up on Sean's live stream, which is community. I have, I have been going to the Brattle for a long, long time, longer than a lot of you have been alive. Uh, I, it feels very comfortable to go. It feels, it feels normal whether I buy anything or not. Uh, but I did buy things. I got a pile of books. So I wanted to show them to you, and we'll start with the mass market paperbacks. Uh, and the first couple of mass market paperbacks are garbage, <laughs> or at least I strongly suspect that they're garbage. We can't judge by appearances, right? <laughs> we wouldn't want to judge by appearances, now would we? <laughs> uh, th that would be a, a, an ill-advised thing to do for a whole number of reasons. <laughs> uh, uh, like, for instance, the uh, the abortive car email correspondence that I had just a couple of weeks ago from someone who encountered my channel, saw my email address, emailed me, uh, calling me old man <laughs> and saying, uh, yeah, I, do I haven't really watched any of your videos. You just I'm just amazed you could figure out the technology. And, uh, 
I took the liberty of looking, of looking around a little. The person who sent that email has a YouTube channel. <laughs> They've made, I think, 115, 116 videos. Not a bad total. It doesn't really uh, cut the mustard against 5,000, but it's not the quantity that matters. I looked, saw this person had a YouTube channel, and came that close. I'm sure that this, this person is not watching now. I came that close to writing back, of course, I'm not going to. If you write me, if you send me an email that contains a personal insult, you're not going to get a response. I, I do not fall into the 21st century trap that we have all just normalized, where opening the conversation with a deep personal insult is no big deal. The conversation is supposed to just flow on from there, and maybe a year from now you'll retract the insult. No, 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 no. I am a denizen of a much earlier century. And that doesn't fly. A personal insult ends correspondence. It doesn't begin it. But I came that close anyway to writing back and saying, well, you're being pretty dismissive of a clueless old man based purely on appearances. I see you have a YouTube channel. Care to have a live debate? You pick the subject. <laughs> see how the old man does? <laughs> but anyway, uh, I don't know if these, well, actually, one of these two things, I know that it is trash, <laughs> but the other one I'm not aware of at all. Maybe one of you will be. This is by Marcus, Marcus Pellegrimus, and it is a Skinner's novel. Uh, this one is called Teeth of Beasts. That's a rather evocative cover, not just, not, not just the traps, <laughs> not, just, not, the, not traps as in, you know, springboard things on the ground, but traps as in the kind of thing you have to work lovingly on at the gym. <laughs> Not just that, but also I like the cover illustration. It's it's simple and kind of moody. Uh, and this is, uh, I, I guess, not the first novel. Uh, yeah, okay, it looks like there are two other Skinner's books. One is called Blood Blade, and one is called Howling Legion. I didn't see either one of those today, so this will be my first Skinner's novel. Uh, what here? Unbeknownst to the human population, a pestilence is raging through an unseen community of low-level monstrosities. <laughs> I also read it. <laughs> what seems at first glance a boon for the mortal cause has horrific connotations, as the Skinner team of Cole Warnicky and Paige Strobel races across the Midwest to uncover the shocking secrets of the mud flu. <laughs> for a nightmare of destruction and blood sacrifice is looming one born of an unholy meeting nearly two centuries ago that will pit man against beast and skinner against skinner so i don't know i don't really know what what skinners are uh but i'm hoping that oh, what's his name again marcus pellegrimus i'm hoping that he keeps his wits about them and and uh makes this a standalone book. I'm hoping that I don't have to read the other two because I don't have them and I saw no sign of them. I'm not going to wait. Uh, I, I'm not going to wait any longer, I should say, than August. When it is possible that a booktube event of monstrous proportions is coming your way, celebrating the reading of garbage. <laughs> it's entirely possible that that is happening. Uh, so, any, if any of you know these Skinner books, I'd love to hear what you think of them, what I'm in for. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> sorry, I'm still thinking about that. Now that I that I, I told the story, I've got that putz in my email back on my mind. I, I, I fortunately, I'm preaching the converted when it comes to this little corner of booktube. You are not going to judge anything by appearances. That would be very wise. <laughs> That'd be very wise in a number of different cases. I'm not the only sharp tool in the box here. <laughs> uh, the but anyway, as I was saying, the next book. I know it's trash. I read it when it came out. It's garbage. Uh, but it was mighty enjoyable, so I'm happy to have another copy. This is by John Jakes, uh, who wrote a little bit of everything and wrote all the time. This is an instance where I'm going... This is where I would ordinarily just confidently say that this, this author must have died sometimes in the last 10 years. But this is probably an example where one of you is going to say, Nope, he's still alive. <laughs> that happens all the time. And it just makes you feel like I've stepped on you know somebody's grave. <laughs> but the author is John Jakes. And the book is Brack the Barbarian. <laughs> and you might be thinking... Well, Brack the Barbarian, isn't it Conan the Barbarian? It pretty much is, yes. <laughs> this uh, Brack the Barbarian, into the thrice-fired hell of Yob Hoggoth, strode the yellow-haired giant of the north. So not a raven, not a black-haired giant of the north, but a yellow-haired giant of the north, who has nothing to do 
to bring to the fight against all the supernatural forces that he will encounter in the decadent South, other than his mighty thews and his lowbrow and his lack of imagination. Not a good strategist, really physically strong, but that's it. Uh, the the magical forces that, that uh, Brack the Barbarian encounters should make mincemeat of him in about five seconds. Same thing with Conan. Uh, but of course they don't. <laughs> they don't. What have we got here? Uh, Brack the Barbarian, outcast, fortune hunter, mighty swordsman, battles Septagundus, Amir of evil, whose very flesh was etched with humans writhing in torment. Ariani, honey-voiced snare of the devil. The darter boys, from whose fingertips burst agonizing pain in green crimson beams. Doom dog, fanfish, to mook the thing which crawls. <laughs> Roaring his outrage, Brack hefted his great battle axe and set out to make good his vow that not all the sorcery in this evil land of Yob Hagoth would bar his way south to the golden city of his dreams. I remember this book, but I'm going to give it another try, but I'm going to, I'm going to inoculate myself for a bit first. <laughs> I will, I will throw it on the pile for August. Uh, then the next three books that I got, the last of the mass market paperbacks here, are Murder Mysteries. Uh, I got one in the this these Penguin Mystery and Crime yellow or uh, green and white mass market paperbacks that I love so much. I have a whole bunch of them going now. I grab them whenever I see them because they tend to be really good. Whatever editorial team they had tend to pick winners. Uh, this one is Murder by an Aristocrat by Mignon Eberhardt. Uh, I got a murder mystery of Mignon Eberhardt's, I think, last year or the year before that, and wasn't much familiar with the name at all. I found it at the Brattle, a mass market paperback. Nothing on the back at all. Look at that. Uh, and I mentioned in that Brattle Hall, whenever it was, uh, that I wasn't familiar with the name. I might even have made a quip that it seemed like a made-up name. I was vaguely familiar with it, but not enough to tell you anything. And uh, I got a few responses to that little lacune on my part, which I have since rectified. Uh, I got a few responses, and those responses spanned the spectrum from, oh, wow, you, you're not all that familiar with her? It's so rare to encounter an author that you don't know anything about. I happen to have read quite a few of Eberhardt's books. I think they're really good. Here's what I like about them. Here's what I don't from that end of the spectrum all the way to the other end of the spectrum where the person says, huh, you've never heard of her? She's even more famous than Agatha Christie. Wow, guess I have to reevaluate re re how much you've read. So we span the spectrum all the way from, oh, wow, that's interesting, tell me more, to screw you and the horse you rode in on, <laughs> and everything in between. <laughs> there is no one in the mystery writing genre more famous than Agatha Christie, even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So kindly put a sock in it <laughs> but i don't have uh, a description for this thing it's just a clean it's just a clean bag i i confess i grabbed it only because uh i love this series i don't remember being blown away by i've read now two uh eberhardt novels both starring a nurse sleuth if i remember correctly a uh, keen last name keen uh, i don't remember being blown away by either one of them uh I read all sorts of, I read about the author as well as reading the author, and I read, I read all sorts of uh, stuff about how this author's prose line is very good, very elegant. Uh, I didn't see that. Maybe this will be the one that does it. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, and then the next two, the last two mass market paperbacks I got were right alongside one that I found, I, what was it, earlier this week? <laughs> These are Earl Stanley Gardner, who I usually don't like all that much, but he has a series about uh, the DA, uh, that they're, they're all just, the, the DA does this, the DA does that. That's the title. Started off with the DA calls it murder. The DA is Doug Selby, who is a, a new and crusading DA in a town who's just taken over from the possibly corrupt and certainly complacent previous DA. And he starts to see mysterious murders everywhere. And he's, I really enjoy them. I've read a lot of Earl Stanley Gardner that I don't enjoy nearly as much. Uh, and I have uh, a few DA novels in those old original hardcover editions with the, the great period illustrations on the dust jackets and the feather lightness because of the crappy quality of the paper involved, the wartime rationing quality of the paper involved. Though somebody unloaded a library of those a couple of years ago at the Brattle and I got a bunch of them. 
uh, and read uh, just scattershot at at will, just blind to read through them to see which ones appealed to me. And it was the DA ones that did. Uh, and I grabbed these two mass market paperbacks of DA novels because I thought, you know, I don't specifically remember the titles of the ones that I have. So if these are DA novels that I haven't already read, great, then I have new ones to read. And if they are duplicates of those hardcovers, well, paperbacks will be a little easier to carry around. It turns out they're both duplicates. So I already have these in hardcover. I have, this is the DA uh, Holds a Candle. And the DA cooks a goose <laughs> in these neat little pocket paperbacks that are so deceptively tough. They really can take a beating. Uh, so that's great. Those were those were some murder mysteries, um, ostensibly from March Mystery Madness, but that's a long way away. Who knows if any of us will reach March Mystery Madness? So I will read them. Uh, well, these DA ones, I might not. I might not uh, read them anytime soon because I've read them comparatively recently anyway I read the hardcovers that's there the, the DA cooks a goose I think is the one that cemented it for me that I really really like this series uh, the DA calls it murder I thought wow that was good that was the best Earl Stanley Gardner thing I've ever read I wonder if any other book in the DA series comes anywhere close to being this good uh, and then I read the, the DA Cooks a Goose, and that sort of sealed the deal for me. That uh, that is not the DA. <laughs> that sort of sealed the deal for me that these would probably all be enjoyable. I haven't actually read them all. There are there are I think four DA novels that I've never even seen. I just see I know about them because I look in you know the list of other Earl Stanley Gardner books. Uh, then we have the hardcovers, and they are all over the map. We'll start with we'll start and finish. Let's start and finish with nature. <laughs> the first one is a, a book from the 1970s. It's a 695 hardcover, so I'm guessing the 1970s. Uh, is that right? Yeah, 1973. And I read this then uh, uh, at, I believe this was an acquisition of the Boston Public Library. I think I read this. I think I got this out of the Boston Public Library. There have been times in my life uh, where I was a zealous patron of the BPL. I would just, I would just go and get uh, a bunch of books and just, you know, I was working, so I didn't have quite as much time to read, but I would, I would go and get a bunch of books. I was there. I was working in the area, so I was able to go to the library almost every day and change out books. And this was one of them, and I, it made a lasting impression on me. I wrote about it in my journal, and I, at the time, said, the brattle will provide. Sooner or later, I will see a copy of this. This is, uh, Far more the later than the sooner, but I finally have it again. Now that I have it, I'll, I'll just mark it and keep it. Uh, this is by Douglas Fairbain, with illustrations by Betty Fraser, and it's called A Squirrel Forever, where the author takes in a squirrel that, as you can see from the illustration, his cat was going to kill. Uh, and he doesn't domesticate the squirrel. Don't let the name Chippy fool you. He doesn't domesticate. The, it's a nightmare. Squirrels are not pets. Uh, most of them aren't. Some of them, I, I've seen YouTube videos, some of them get along quite well. They just, they, they change their behavior completely and just sort of acclimate to being a pet inside the house. But this one never did. The, the anecdotal stories that I've heard, most of them don't. Uh, but this I, was a terrific book. I wonder if it has photographs. Do I remember that? It, yes, it does. It has photographs in addition to, uh, in addition to these drawings. There are drawings all throughout and the drawings are really good. There's giving water to a raccoon. Uh, it, it's a minor classic uh, in the in the vein of, uh, of that Quail Robert or even Born Free or Ring of Bright Water. I don't know why it's not better known because it's it's tremendously evocative. Right? If it could stick in my mind all these years, then it has to be tremendously evocative. I'm very happy to have a copy at long last. I will I will clean it up and, uh, and reinforce. Oh look at that! <laughs> look at that! Uh, with compliments of the author. <laughs> so this was a review copy. It wasn't. It didn't go to me. I promise. This is. This was never been in my hands before. So there you go. That the last time I saw this was a library book. Terrific to find. And as again, all these things were free. They were all store credit. Uh, then this next one, the kind of wild gamble that you can take when the books are a dollar a piece. You just, if it seems remotely interesting, you grab it. And if it ends up not being remotely interesting, well. I have plenty of ways to get rid of books, <laughs> but I have a feeling this is going to be very interesting. This is a collection of uh, letters, uh, 
uh, let me see here. This is a, a collection of letters between uh, David Garnett and T.H. White, the author of The Once and Future King. It's just very drably called The White Garnett Letters. <laughs> there they are. Uh, I think the Garnett family is just incredibly interesting, from Constance Garnett all the way down to, uh, to her son and so on. Uh, I think these are just fantastic. Uh, Garrett, it, it, Garnett is, I have a couple of biographies of him. I think he's, if anything, more interesting than T.H. White, who, as far as I know, has never had a really great full-dress biography. If, if there's been one, maybe it was in England and never released in America. I don't know of one. Uh, I want, I could take the opportunity to wholeheartedly recommend The Once and Future King. If you have not read The Once and Future King, you're missing one of the great classics of 20th century literature. Uh, but I can't wait to see what, what their correspondence is like. Uh, and I'm a sucker for correspondence books anyway. You get to know the two, excuse me, you get to know the two people involved in a book like this uh, better than any biography can can show them to you even when you know as i think i remember is true in this case that the two are posturing to each other that that the letters are are uh theatrical constructions of versions of their own personalities rather than for instance something they might confess to a diary even when that's the case you end up knowing the correspondence really really well when you're done with a volume like this it's going to take a little bit of love and care to fix this up maybe i'll just read it with the dust jacket off and, and not bother to fix it up in case i don't want to keep it but i think that it could go on a shelf with my other with, i have two uh david garnett biographies he's he's a i think a fascinating figure a fascinating bloomsbury figure who didn't die until the late 1970s, the 1980s, something like that. So what, what feels like a full century after his heyday. Uh, then this next one, uh, I saw it and I grabbed it. And my first thought was uh, that it should go on the steadily growing pile of books destined for Vermont, destined for Mark Richardson, uh, especially for the nautical corner of his library. And then uh, I started looking through it. Uh, and the more I looked through it, the more I thought, Mark who? <laughs> Vermont what? <laughs> I may keep this myself and just wait to find another copy from Mark. This is by uh, L.A. Wilcox, who not only wrote it, but illustrated it himself. And it's called Mr. Peeps' Navy. It's a, it's a book about uh, the aspect of Samuel Pepys that we tend not to remember. Look at that. Look at that. Those are the warships of Henry VIII's day. That's drawn by the author. That's absolutely incredible. And you can tell uh, from just what you're looking at that every single line of that is historically accurate. You can tell. You can just, you, it gives off that feeling. Uh, here's a, it's a sheer hulk in uh, Pepys' day. The thing that we forget, that people tend to forget about Samuel Pepys because he's so famous for his diary, is that he was a naval official in Restoration Navy and uh, really changed a lot about the Navy, really implemented all sorts of reforms that put the Navy on a professional basis. Uh, there are a number of people, there have been a number of, of naval historians that call him the savior of the British Navy. Uh, and in addition to that, another thing that, that, in addition to his reforms that we know a lot about, and that I think would have guaranteed Pepys a minor place in history anyway, even if his diary had never come to light, even if he destroyed it, uh, the diary, of course, is the thing that secures his immortality, but he would still exist as a very lively footnote, and not only for his naval reforms, but also for something else that'll be more, I bet that Wilcox praises him to the skies for it. It's more along the lines of something that a historian would value, uh, and that is that Pepys didn't just reform the navy, he also gathered into his own hands a, hell, a heaping pile of naval records sorry for the unbelievable epic background noise but i can't be screaming the whole time but but i don't i don't want to stop the video at 25 minutes so we're just going to keep going and i'll just trust that i that it sounds worse to me than it does to you uh in addition to reforming the navy it was what i was trying to say before the you know the indy 500 started outside peeps also gathered a whole bunch of historical records from earlier eras of the British Navy, of the of English ships at sea, and all sorts of stuff like that. He had a mania 
for that sort of thing. He was a bookman in addition to a diarist and a lech and uh, a kiss up and whatnot. He was also a, he valued that sort of thing at a time when even antiquarians usually did not. And he grabbed all of those documents, had a lot of them transcribed, had a lot of them privately bound. We wouldn't know about any of those things probably if he hadn't done that. Uh, so this is this is this is great. I hope that this book goes into uh, a lot. Oh. oh, baby, how you doing? Is nobody's bothering you? There's our man. There's Samuel Pepys. I hope this book goes into a lot of detail about that aspect and not just what he did for the Navy. But I'm up for it. I'm up for it either way. A Pepys book that isn't. Oh, what's the matter, baby? Oh God. Oh, baby. There's nowhere for you to get down here. Here, let me. Let me move all this stuff out of the way. Oh my God. The baby wants to lay down right next to me and the whole place is full. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so I should be prepared for that. Uh, then this this uh, next one is uh, an explicit biography. The Peace Book has a lot of biographical elements. The next thing is just a biography, and it was a find. I'm very happy. I've never seen it before, and I've never read it, even though the author is one of my favorites. This is David Kennedy writing a biography of the great historian Trevelyan. Uh, who you wouldn't think, I mean, I'll, I, I've heard this ref referenced, all sorts of things. This is, I think, viewed as the kind of definitive life of, of the author. Uh, but you wouldn't think, I wouldn't think on the surface that, that Trevelyan's life could possibly make for interesting reading. It had no conflict. It had no drama. It had no hardship. It, it was ease and comfort and privilege and acclaim followed by a long stately funeral. <laughs> uh, but I, David Kennedy is not a boring writer. He cannot do anything in a boring way. And I will, I will gladly gobble up any prose of his that I can find, any books at all. So I grab this, absolutely. And I wonder, I wonder if it will uh, make me want to read this author again. I bet it does. Maybe not his books on Garibaldi, <laughs> which I know, I know that, uh, the Garibaldi books really made him. They really cemented his reputation, and I've heard a lot of people praise them. I think they're deadly dull. But his history of England, I would love to. I wonder if I, I wonder if this book will make me want to go back to it. I have a Penguin Classic abridged one volume of his history of England. I haven't touched in years. I wonder if this will send me back to that. I don't know. This is this is close to the top of the list uh, for, in terms of reading what I found today. Uh, then this next book uh, is allied to some. A couple of books that I found the last time I was at the Bradle. I, last time I was at the Bradle, I found a hundred-year-old history, a biography of uh, Pericles, the fourth-century Athens orator and statesman, and I also found a book in the Centers of Civilization called Athens in the Age of Pericles. And the two, finding the two of them together, sort of combined with Con Igledon's new historical novel, which is about Pericles, to sort of, you know, sometimes that will happen. You'll get, you'll have this little nodule of of associated titles that will suddenly spark a renewed interest in something that happens to me all the time. And, uh, right along those lines today, I found the ultimate, the ultimate thing for a dollar. Oh, unbelievably happy to see this. This is the, the Cambridge ancient history. They do a, a multi-volume history of the ancient world. They draw in, uh, no one volume is by any one scholar. They've drawn in separate pointed essays from a whole bunch of different experts. This is uh, volume five, Athens, with Pericles right there on the cover. <laughs> and it has uh, the most beautiful maps that you have ever done seen. <laughs> Look at this. I want to see if I can do this without destroying it. I am, as came up on Sean's live stream, a little hard on books, <laughs> but I want to show you. It has these fold out onion skin maps that are just so beautiful. This has the Peloponnesian War, and uh, the, it has a whole chapter on Pericles. Look at the the, uh, the map at the front here. I want to see if I can do this without destroying it. The map at the front has red uh, highlighting to, to show you uh, the economics of ancient Greece. So you've got uh, one area is highlighted in red with pigs, or hemp, or corn, or, or whatnot. Uh, Attica is oil, wine, pottery, silver, and honey. Uh, Sicily is corn, cheese, hides, pigs. Fantastic. And those, th these kinds of maps, they're all throughout this volume. Uh, 
Oh, here's one that's not a foldout map. Instead, it is just uh, terrain, a couple of key areas, for, uh, the ground of a couple of key battles. This is the Cambridge Ancient History volume, essentially on Pericles. So <laughs> I was tremendously happy to find it. Uh, then the other explicit biography, uh, again, one that I have only read through a library. In fact, I believe it was the Boston Public Library a long, long time ago. I think I read this at the Boston Public Library and really liked it and uh, just assumed that someday I would find it again. And I did at long last. This is Arthur Weigel's uh, Life of Mark Antony, an ex-library copy. Uh, but not the Boston Public Library. The Boston Public Library was a lighter shade of blue than this. So there we go. That's what this is. Just a big uh, 1931 soup to nuts biography of uh, Mark Antony. There's Julius Caesar, of course. <laughs> fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I don't, know whether I, I don't know whether I feel like making a cover for this thing. Sometimes that can be a lot of fun. Uh, I, might, I might do that. But uh, either way tremendously happy to have it and perfectly timed for a reread <laughs> perfectly timed because i haven't read it since i read it that first time at the library same thing with the squirrel forever uh and then the last book uh we'll go back to nature and this one uh this is the dust jacket is in irreparable shape i often show you dust jackets that are in rough shape and say i can save this this one i might be able to save but it wouldn't be worth the effort i'd be at it for an hour uh so i'll just destroy the dust jacket uh this is a big illustrated children's book called Homes and Habits of Wild Animals. Uh, and fortunately, the, the uh, naked hardcover... Uh, I see, this thing is just coming apart. The naked hardcover is the same artwork, so I, don't, I won't be losing anything to just get rid of the, the dust jacket. And this is inscribed uh, to Anne and John from Charles, Michael, Philip, and Betsy, Christmas 1947. <laughs> and this came out in, uh, this is, uh, it's written by Carl Patterson Schmidt of the Field Museum of Natural History, and it's illustrated by Walter Weber, and it came out in 1934, and it is full of color plates that I just love. I absolutely love this kind of thing. These old, lovely, anecdote-driven, illustrated natural history books. I think we lost a lot, uh, Oh, wow, there's a jaguar. Uh, I think we lost a lot uh, when photography entered the scene in books like this. That, oh my, talk about Vermont. <laughs> there's, a, there's a fisher cat chasing a, a, a poor squirrel up in the trees. Once photography entered the, the scene, and all of a sudden natural history books like this, I mean, this is for kids, so it won't go into great detail, but still, natural history books like this stopped commissioning artwork. They just had photographs instead, and it changed the nature of these things. Uh, that I don't know. Oh, there's an, an opossum with a loaded back. Look at that! Fantastic, fantastic. This also has black and white spot illustrations all throughout. Uh, just liberally illustrated. There's a, a coyote with cubs. There's a bear with cubs. Uh, we're gonna get one more color thing here. A fox. <laughs> I am going to have a great deal of fun going through this, and it will go right in the little book room. There are a few shelves in there for oversized books. Uh, but this this kind of thing, big illustrated children's guides to animals, I just love them. Absolutely love them. Uh, so, and I'll get here. Let's get rid of the dust jacket because it's not salvageable. Uh, so there you go. That was a, a Brattle book haul. A little bit unexpected. Uh, I made a deadline, and I treated myself. So we have Homes and Habits of Wild Animals. Uh, we have Life and Times of Mark Anthony, the greatest Mark Anthony biography that's ever been done in English. Uh, by a fascinating figure in his own right, this, this actually the authors to a lot of these things were uh, to the manner born. <laughs> so it's just total coincidence. Uh, then we have The Cambridge Ancient History, the volume on Athens, uh, that is in large part, uh, there, I mean, there's a chunk of it that's about Pericles, so that's great. Not that he means he needs, he doesn't need to be the focus of me reading about ancient Greece again. Then uh, David Kennedy's biography of Trevelyan, great, fantastic, came out in the, in the early 1990s, I think, so I wasn't in book reviewing. I never got a copy. Uh, now, see, the bean made me mess up the books here. We have Mr. Peep's Navy, uh, again, heavily illustrated. We have uh, the T.H. The White, uh, David Garnett letters, um, edit, edited by him, 
we have a squirrel forever another old find from the library fantastic uh, we have uh, let's see here uh, oh no oh there we go we have two DA books by Earl Stanley Gardner the DA holds a candle and the DA cooks a goose we have murder by an aristocrat by Mignon Eberhardt uh, who has no no shakes of a fascinating life herself uh, we have uh, Brack the Barbarian by John Jakes. And we have a Skinner's novel, Teeth of Beasts. Uh, and a lot of these things made me yearn for uh, other books. The Skinner book made me yearn for uh, others, the other two Skinner novels. Uh, the DA books made me yearn for paperbacks of all the other DA books. Uh, a Squirrel Forever made me yearn for a hardcover copy of another squirrel book called A Most Gentle People, which is another thing that I got from the library uh, and wished I could find a copy of. Uh, uh, what else have we got here? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Weigel's book on Mark Anthony, his biography of Mark Anthony, uh, makes me yearn for all of his books. Weigel was an Egyptologist. Uh, he wrote a biography of Mark Anthony, but almost everything else that he wrote was about Egypt. I think he wrote a biography of Nero as well. But, but uh, mostly it was Egypt. And in addition to the standard stuff, like I think he wrote a biography of Cleopatra, he also wrote uh, uh, two or maybe even three rip-snortingly great books about his experiences in Egypt at the golden age of Egypt, uh, at the dawn of, of Egyptology. He was deeply involved with Lord Carnarvon, deeply involved with Howard Carter, deeply involved with digs in all of these quintessential name recognition places. And yet his is, his is not a name that we that people tend to know off uh, you know and the books that he wrote are long gone uh, though I forget even what they were called which is you know I'm not helping any there I'm not helping to keep the memory alive but they I read them we the the an old library that I belonged to years and years and years ago had a whole shelf of him and they are terrific I would I would ordinarily dream that if the person got rid of this Mark Anthony book, they might have got rid of those as well. But no, the person probably wanted this Mark Anthony book. It's an ex-library copy. Probably the library that it comes from only had this and not any of, of uh, Weigel's archaeological travel adventure books, which are, they're all nonfiction. They're so good. They're just so good. Maybe I'll find them someday. The Brattle will provide. But anyway, that's, this has gone on quite long enough. That was an unexpected Brattle trip that, with plenty of digressions and ruminations. Uh, so I'll wrap this up, and I will see you soon. Thank you, Book 2.